Today we're going to be addressing um, in this subject of taboo, things the church doesn't talk about. Um, I drew the straw to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I loved Wezo Mangela's sermon last Sunday. He preached on the will of God and the taboo of the will of God. Uh, I told him he got off really, really easy to that. Wezo just gave me that Wezo smile. And I know he's praying for me. I want to say today that there's going to be good news in this message. But I want us to look seriously at Scripture this morning because we may be dealing with one of the most um, misunderstood, abused, and maybe misused uh, passages in all of the Bible. I'd like for us to stand out of respect for God's Word, turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel, the 16th chapter, 49th. In the 50th verses. This was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and the needy. They were haughty and did abominable things before me. Therefore, I removed them when I saw it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Now this morning, I want to get real with you. I can't really address this topic this morning um, without... um, dealing a little bit with the pain within our denomination that has led to the divisiveness and the separation. It's there. I would be disingenuous if I didn't name it and talk about it in the context of this particular passage of Scripture, this story about Sodom and Gomorrah. And before we get there, let let me say today that we are dealing with such a passage that we all need to pay attention this morning and see if we can get it right. Because it's gotten been gotten wrong so many times. Now I want to say this morning that I am a United Methodist Christian because of the many things I love about our church. But primarily, I'm a United Methodist Christian because I believe in evangelism. I believe in in bringing people into that saving relationship with Jesus Christ, or as we say it here at Lover's Lane, loving all people into relationship with Jesus Christ. And, And that saving relationship is not only about going to heaven or our eternal future. That saving relationship is primarily about how we increase the love of God Um, for others and how we increase our love for God. It's about how we live a life that Jesus said he, he came to bring, which is that abundant life, and how we live that life in such love of neighbor and God. You know, when I see in our world the scenes of 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 men or oftentimes young men, it's never, hardly ever, ever women who pick up an assault rifle, rifle, an, an instrument of power, and they kill African American people or Jewish people or gay and lesbian people because of who they are. It grieves me. And it causes me to wonder if the church is really uh, doing a good job with our primary mission. You know, our society in general is becoming more and more toxic and divided. Suspicious of, suspicions of others who are different and, and even, even hateful activity against those persons seems to be on the rise. And we are far, far, far removed 
from the kingdom of God and the abundant life that Jesus came to bring. Do you believe that in general? It's not that we haven't been here before, maybe in the 50s, 60s, I don't know. But, but it seems like that it's risen its head again, this hatred and this separating of culture into groups of people. You know, I read an interesting article that was sent to me by one of you out there. It was written on August the 19th, 2023, it's in the Wall Street Journal, written by a man named Ryan Berg. He's a Baptist pastor, an associate professor of political science at Eastern Illinois University. And he also is a, a research director in a group called Faith Counts. And he wrote this. In the last year, at least 20% of the United Methodist congregations in the U.S. have broken away to join a new denomination, the Global Methodist Church, which has positioned itself as a more conservative refuge for those um, um, do not, who do not support the United Methodist stance on issues like same-sex marriage. And the end result is that congregations will become more ideologically homogenous. Now, when religion becomes so politically uniform, it can have corrosive effects on democracy. The conservatism of white Christian churches has helped to lead tens of millions of liberal Americans to leave religion behind entirely and join the ever-increasing ranks of the non-religious. In 2021, 51% of the people who identified as politically liberal said that they had no religious affiliation compared with just 12% of the people who identified as conservative. Now, now remember what I said about the importance of evangelism. In general, Americans are becoming less tolerant of people who are different from us. Social scientists theorize that coming into direct contact with a member of a different group will reduce intolerance, prejudice, and skepticism toward that group. That's likely why Americans' views on same-sex marriage moved so rapidly. More and more Americans personally knew someone who are le someone's who are lesbian, gay, or bisexual, and thus have become more willing to support such marriage. Gallup's most recent poll says that 71% of U.S. citizens support such marriages. Now, houses of worship would thus be ideal spaces for social contacts to flourish. Hear him. If churches, synagogues, and mosques were once again full of people from across the economic and political spectrum, it would help build bridges not just in the congregation but in the larger community. As a Baptist pastor, he said, I know that houses of worship are ideal places to build community. Religious leaders need to remember the crucial role that houses of worship play in holding our society together. The future of American religion and maybe American democracy depends on it. You know, I believe this so much that I have to grieve that 20% of United Methodists deciding to give up on the concept of diversity and our long-standing commitment to a pluralism in our church, in our denomination, and believing that being with people who think exactly alike and look exactly alike is the way forward. The split in our church is primarily because some agreed that LGBTQ people are sinful because of who they are and who they love. Is that the way to build the kingdom of God and all the love that it stands for? 
And what do our younger generations that we're trying to attract, what, what, are, what are their views? And here we are, Sodom and Gomorrah, the moment you've been waiting for. You know, the story is in Genesis, but in order to appreciate the 19th chapter of Genesis, where it's located, you have to back up a chapter to the 18th chapter of Genesis. Now hear me, are you listening? You can be a United Methodist and not be of one mind on a plethora of different socio-political hot-button issues, including these issues related to marriage and whether gay and lesbian people can be ordained. No one is forcing our church or any UMC to act contrary to a pastor or a local church's convictions. The issue today is how we treat Scripture to enforce our beliefs. We have churches in places like Oak Lawn, and we have churches in rural areas like Jacksboro. We have churches that... Um, are historical African-American churches like St. Paul downtown that are 150 years old. The question is, are we tolerant, as Wesley instructed us to be, recognizing that we don't all have to believe alike, but we all must love alike? Wesley saw this train coming back in the 1700s. He knew even then that people didn't all agree when it came to Scripture. But we could all love alike. Today's story in the 19th chapter of, um, of Genesis starts, as I said, in the 18th chapter. Where these visitors, you remember, come to uh, Abraham and, and, and Sarah, and they basically, these uh, who are angels, they're treated with great hospitality, which is the charge uh, that all uh, Hebrew people had. You treat the stranger as if the stranger is an angel. And they promise Abraham and Sarah that they're going to be the parents of a great nation. Remember, Sarah laughed out loud. But then, as they left Sarah and Abraham, they said that they were going to go to Sodom and Gomorrah. They had work to do there. And Abraham said, well, let me go with you. And as they were on the trip to Sodom and Gomorrah, the angels, these same uh, two men, uh, they uh, say that they're going there to destroy the city. That God had instructed them to destroy the city. So Abraham starts bargaining. Now, this is a sermon in and of itself. Abraham said, oh, God, if we can find 50 people in the city who are righteous, would you save it? God said, yeah, sure. Well, what about 45? Yeah. What about 40? Here goes Abraham. What about 30? What about 20? God said, sure. What if we could find 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah? Would you save the city? And God said, yeah. And the bad news is they couldn't find ten righteous people. It was only Lot and his little family who were righteous in all of Sodom and, and, and Gomorrah. And here's some scripture from that text. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gateway of Sodom. And when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them. And he bowed down with his face to the ground, and Lot said, Please, my lords, turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet, and you can rise early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the square. But Lot urged them strongly, so they turned aside to him, and they entered his house. And he made them a feast, and he baked unleavened bread, and they ate. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people of the, to the last man surrounded the house and they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may know them. 
In other words, Lot, you bring those men out to us so that we can have our way with these strangers, these aliens, these refugees who've come into our city. In other words, this story is about this evil mob who wants to rape the aliens and the strangers who are in the care of Lot's hospitality. And rape is primarily an act of violence that's fueled by hate, is it not? That's what this story is about. You know, we need to know that the supreme value of a righteous Hebrew person, and I dare say a Christian in that tradition, is the value of hospitality. We are judged by God on how we treat the stranger in our midst. How we treat those who may be um, like the visitors to Lot, those aliens, those, those strangers. They just might be angels. Remember, it was the hospitality that was offered to these strangers, these angels, by Abraham and Sarah that resulted in the promise that they were going to be the parents of a great nation. And Lot is providing hospitality, but not only that, he's providing protection to these men who have come into his house. Do you think that the message here might just be how important it is to protect strangers and refugees? And do you think a strong case could be made that the primary sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was their cruel and unusual treatment of strangers who had come into their city? You know, the evil mob terms their hatred and their anger toward Lot. When Lot stands up against them, here's what is said in Scripture. When Lot says, stand back. And they said, this fellow came here as an alien. And he would play the judge. They're talking about Lot. Now we will deal worse with you, Lot, than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man, Lot. And came near the door to break it down. But the men inside, the angels, they reached out their hands and they brought Lot into the house with them. And they shut the door and they struck with blindness the men who were at the door of the house, both small and great, so that they were unable to find the door. You don't mess with angels, friends. That's the point of that. Don't mess with angels. They can do it. And the story ends with Lot and his family being protected from the fire and brimstone that is rained down from heaven upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And you remember how it ends? Lot's wife disobeys the angels. The angels said to her, and all of them, don't look back. But Lot's wife looked back and something happened to her. What happened? She turned into a pillar of salt. I'm telling you, don't mess with angels. What a story. Now, I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you believe the Bible? Well, that's kind of loaded. Let me say that it's tempting to bring the explanation we want to the Bible rather than to let the Bible teach us. We're afraid of the power of the Bible. It seems that many, when a passage does not fit preconceived notions, the brain simply discards it. And I love how we say it in our, our vision statement, that we passionately engage the Bible. We let it speak to us, inform us, teach us, right? So folks, we'll tell you that this biblical account of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is about the sin of homosexuality. 
Yet the Bible itself has a different slant on this. A, a different biblical truth that we need to hear. And I'm going to let the Scripture speak for itself. You turn to Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter, the 14th verse, and you read what Scripture says about Sodom and Gomorrah. And among the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen something terrible. They commit adultery and they live a lie. They strengthen the hands of the evildoers so that not one of them turns from their wickedness. They are all like Sodom to me. Now, I guess you could stretch adultery and living a lie to be defined as the sin of homosexuality, but let me tell you something, that's a long stretch. Amos, in the fourth chapter, he affirms that the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah are greed and, cor and, and, and corresponding uh, a corresponding lack of charity. That's what Sodom and Gomorrah is about. Greed and a lack of charity. That's all he said. And then you go to this Ezekiel passage that we read this morning, which is quite straightforward. It lines out what the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah are right there in the Scripture. It starts off by saying, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. This is it. And for those who take the Bible literally, you'd think that we'd want to know exactly what it was. The book of Ezekiel says clearly, the first thing is their pride. The second thing is their haughtiness. The third thing is their hoarding riches at the expense of the poor. And then the fourth thing is Abominable sin. And, and what's that? It doesn't clearly state. But if you read the scripture clearly, you know that that sin must have had something to do with the, the violence and the hatred that they had for these visitors that they would want to, as a mob, have their way with them. That's it. And the original Genesis 19 seems to have nothing that matches our modern understanding of same-sex partnerships and relationships of love. Nothing. It seems like the wicked people of Sodom were violent and focused on partying and rowdy pleasure-seeking while the poor suffered. They were treated, they treated each other as outrageous displays of selfishness and meanness. And these are the ab abominable uh, acts. Even the violence of gang rape. Why would people take Ezekiel's passage above and ignore the, the three stated points before you get to the acts. You know, preachers should be pounding the pulpit over and over again about pride and greed and how we treat strangers in our land. If we want to be consistent with Scripture, there are hundreds, even thousands of scriptures that has to do, scriptures that have to do with greed and pride and hatred, for example. There are six in all of Scripture that have to do with homosexuality, and many of those are called into question about whether or not they're about things like rape. Now, let me ask you a question. Are pride and greed no longer major problems in our world today? Is that why we just kind of skip over the main thing? Because we've gotten so good related to pride and greed? 
The United Nations claims that around 21,000 people die every single day from hunger and hunger-related causes. Now, how do we sit with that, given that many of us have time, have talent, have treasures, and we spend uh, a lot of that time and talent and treasures enjoying life? There's nothing wrong with that unless it is at the exclusion, even the damage of relationship with others. It seems like to me that a true reading of the Sodom and Gomorrah story would lead us more to a comparison related to what Jesus said in Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 31 and 40 through 46, if we want to get biblical. Remember Jesus said, oh, all of you over here, you sheep, you're the ones who treated me with, with compassion. You're the ones who brought me uh, food when I was hungry and water when I was thirsty. You're the ones who visited me in prison and came to see me when I'm sick. You're the ones who took care of me. You're the ones who will inherit the kingdom of God. And, and you other folk over here, you didn't do any of that. That's a better correlation in the New Testament to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah than anything I can think of right now. I've been thinking about Sodom and Gomorrah for a solid week. It's so tempting to bring the explanation we want to the Bible rather than let the Bible teach us. May we be people who learn that God's way is one of generosity and humility and radical others' orientation and hospitality, especially to the strangers and the aliens and the refugees who come our way, who are in need. There was a whole line of them yesterday around this building. I'm going to close this sermon right now. And I think I'm going to close it with Scripture. Is that okay? Hebrews 13, 2, says this. Do not forget to show hospitality to the strangers. For by doing so, Some people have shown hospitality to angels. 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 Without even knowing it.